Hello and welcome to Have Your Say. I'm Ann Minicosi, president of the Community Breakfast Collaborative, here with our co-host, Diana Robertson, who is second vice president of the Pennsylvania State Conference of the NAACP. And we are broadcasting from mainline television, MLTV, public access television, located outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA, and um, on the main line. And our engineer during our time of pandemic via Zoom is General Manager, Dr. Vince Celli. And we are happy today to welcome our guest who we've been wanting to have on the program for a while, but she's a little busy all the time. So we got her between semesters, Lucy Menicosi Whelan. Happy to welcome you here. Lucy is a first year graduate student at Harvard University in the RECA program, R-E-E-C-A, which is Russian, Eastern Europe, Central Asian Studies. And you're going to tell us more about, about that in your, in your introduction. And we're here to discuss today two topics that most of us know very little about. The Fulbright Scholar Program in the United States run by the State Department. And then also Ukraine. Um, most of us know very little about Ukraine. And so I, I think it's great that we're able to have you on the program today, Lucy. So welcome, glad to have you here. And the insight that you can share with us on these two topics is gonna be great um, for our viewers. And so the way that we usually start is if you could give us some biographical information that you wanna share, and I guess especially about your um, educational career so far, how that leads into the, into the Fulbright program. Sure. So thanks so much for having me on your show. Uh, a little bit of my background is that uh, I graduated from Villanova University with a bachelor's degree in Russian area studies and uh, two minors in uh, ethics and communication. After I graduated, I uh, completed a Fulbright student research fellowship in Ukraine. Um, after that, I was an intern at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City during the summer of 2020, uh, virtually. And now I am a graduate student at Harvard University in the, uh, as you mentioned, the RICA program, which stands for Regional Studies, Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. Okay, Lucy. Um, very interesting. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about the Fulbright um, Scholar Program. And um, what is the Fulbright <laughs> Scholarship? So the Fulbright Scholarship is an educational, ex educational exchange and cultural diplomacy scholarship funded by the U.S. Department of State. It sends thousands of Americans abroad every year, and it brings... Um, citizens from many other countries worldwide to the United States to pursue graduate education and, and other opportunities. Okay. So is this a program that you knew about in high school or not until uh, you attended Villanova? I found out about the program when I attended Villanova. There's a center on campus called the Center for Research and Fellowships that does a phenomenal job getting the word out to students to apply for the Fulbright every year. Okay. Um, so it will be something that you, depending upon where students are attending school, um, then you would have to maybe know a little bit of something about it or um, to ask about it. Is, is it something that's readily made available or encouraged um, by universities or colleges? I would say it probably depends on the university. I can only speak about Villanova, but I know mm. that there are Fulbright uh, winners from many universities across the country. Um, internationally, I can't really speak to that uh, right. about how publicized it is, though. Okay. And um, for a little historical background, um, so um, when, I know this was formed a while ago, so um, when was it formed and what was the incentive behind it, if you know? Mm -hmm. 
Sure. So um, the Fulbright Scholarship was started in 1945 by Senator J. William Fulbright. Um, He was a congressman and he wanted to use the surplus war property to fund the promotion of international goodwill through the exchange of students in the fields of education, culture, and science. And the bill was signed into law in 1946 by Harry Truman and Congress created the Fulbright program. Okay. So, 75 years, right? 75 right. years that the program's been in existence. So it's an, a kind of anniversary right now. Yes, it's a big celebration for all the Fulbrighters. Okay. Um, so having said that, um, does the... Um, there's a Fulbright program. Um, well, okay, we're talking about the international perspective and global perspective. Um, and even what your major is and, and, and your studies, let's just say it's not something, and I, and I won't say that many but uh, people, but uh, I mean, in this day and time, a lot of people are going more global. And clearly as a country, we, um, in the world dynamics, we have become a more global society. But um, do you believe that, um, let's just talk about high schools, for example, um, even discuss that enough to, to offer thoughts to students as to the fact this is something that they might want to do. You know, um, I know that the, there are languages and all of that, but is it something that is put in a way of this is how you can use this or this is something that could be beneficial to you in the future? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure if it is emphasized enough. I remember going back to high school, um, I had a required uh, language that I had to study as as part of the requirements to graduate. But interestingly, I didn't start studying Russian because of my high school. I actually started studying Russian on my own um, by checking books out from the library to help me study. And um, it was actually, I actually didn't have time to continue those studies during high school. I started in middle school and I had to, you know, put that on the back burner because high school was so rigorous. And then I mm-hmm. didn't have the opportunity to go back to it until I was in college. Okay. So what languages are offered really depends on the high school. Um, there are some high schools that offer Russian. It just, it really depends. Um, but I think that high schools could do a better job of helping students think internationally and about wanting to become a global citizen. Of course, there are courses that do that. I don't deny that by any means, but mm-hmm. I think it could be it could be done in a more systematic way to show people that, hey, you can study this language and it will take you far. There are many advantages to studying a foreign language and starting it as early as possible and and committing a little bit of time every day to just studying your foreign language. And it becomes uh, a daily practice that will really, really pay off in the long run. Okay. So just a little bit about, I'm always going to bring up questions in regard to diversity, but (laughs) just just from your experience and exposure, um, how diverse do you believe um, the recipients of the Fulbright program is? So in my experience, they do make an effort to um, have a diverse cohort of students. It really depends on the country. Um, okay. You tend to find that applicants who apply to study in Eastern Europe are generally um, not people of color. And there are a lot of initiatives right now to bring people of color into the study of Eastern Europe. Um, okay. But as for the Fulbright program in general, they really do make an effort um, and they have diversity initiatives and a lot of support. Okay. Okay. That's that's good. So um, do you believe um, that there are certain subjects or certain things that would enhance Um, your ability to compete for the Fulbright Scholarship throughout school through, you know, and I always go back to high school because I think a lot of things can happen there that actually um, will be the catalyst to what you might pursue in college. So, yeah. I think it would be really interesting to see a class that 
gives students the opportunity to learn about different cultures mm -hmm. and to try foods from different cultures and learn about different cultures, watch movies, listen to music, study a little bit of the language, and just be able to explore different regions of the world and start to foster that, that interest in international work mm -hmm. and other cultures, even just even beyond just working. Mm -hmm. I would say that having an interest in other cultures is really, really important because we want to make sure that we are as tolerant and understanding as we can be. And I think studying other cultures is a really good way to do that, to begin to learn that people in other countries are just people. Like it's not like mm -hmm. people abroad are totally different from right us as Americans. And I think that that is really important to learn. Okay, great. One thing great. That's coming up here that's really interesting is I'm trying to think as, as you were talking, Lucy, like what course would that be in middle school or high school? And it's not quite history or social studies or something like that. So it's really interdisciplinary at its heart. And Sure, the PTO would have like a multicultural potluck kind of thing, but I think maybe um, the interdisciplinary kind of approach maybe needs to be developed more. And I know certainly there are programs at some schools that have that are interdisciplinary in nature, but I, I'm thinking like, is that, I guess that's my question, um, does, does it need to be an interdisciplinary approach? maybe to get at this idea of, uh, you know, teaching children to be global citizens. Yes, certainly. I think that would make sense, having a little bit of history involved, learning about these other countries, some politics to get a sense of, you know, the structure of the government and those types of things. But I also think that you could just simply call it cultural studies, something along those lines. That field does exist to be able to you know, look at other cultures and, and experience those things as much as you can in a classroom from the United States. Yeah, that would be interesting because I know we're having, you know, in general, a hard enough time just to integrate um, Black studies <laughs> into, into history and the dynamics. So that actually would be interesting to look at it from that whole approach because then you can't exclude, <laughs> you know, it's not as difficult to, um, uh, it's not as easy to exclude certain groups of people, which tends to be, unfortunately, um, the educational system in the United States. <laughs> so yeah. um, some of that might be just how we look at education in the States as well, in, in comparison to um, uh, cultures of all people. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. you know, another thing that I think we really need to say overtly about the Fulbright program is it's part of the State Department, you said that, but that it's free. Once you're mm -hmm. a Fulbright scholar, everything is paid for. Like you had stipends and, and things like that. I don't know if you're able to speak about some of the specifics and also the kind of award that you got um, as far as the types of awards, Lucy. Yes. So yes, that's very important to mention is that you do not have to pay to go abroad when you are a Fulbright student. Um, they pay you. Um, you receive a stipend to, it, it covers your expenses living in the country. You're basically receiving a salary. And mm -hmm. the idea is you might not walk away at the end of the year with extra money, but it will cover you during that time. So you do not have to put your own money uh, towards the Fulbright program at all. They will they will cover it and they also calculate the amount of money that you get um, based on the cost of living in the country that you're going to. So some countries will, they will give you more money and some countries they will give you less money just depending on the cost of living. So, but the goal is always that you never have to invest your own funds when you're a Fulbright student. Yeah, and you okay. had separate money for having your own tutor and other having books and materials covered and things like that. Yes, they do offer two separate stipends along with the award, at least for the program that I did, the, the research uh, fellowship. 
Um, they give you a certain amount of money for language study, and they give you a certain amount of money for research costs. So that's in addition to your cost of living. So do you have to have um, a certain knowledge of the language of the country that you're going to ahead of time? It depends on the country. Okay. So when you apply to the Fulbright program, you can only apply to one country. You pick oh. the country that you're going to in advance mm -hmm. and your entire application is based around why you want to go to that country specifically. Mm. Um, it has to be like you have a, a real reason to be going there. Like your project okay. can only be done from that country. So mm -hmm. when you're applying, it, in, it entirely depends on which country you're applying to. So for example, mm -hmm. for Ukraine, they ask that you have a novice level of either Russian or Ukrainian. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the applicants had more than that, but that doesn't mean by any means that you have to speak the language fluently. Mm -hmm. The goal is to help you grow and to help enrich you. So it just depends on the application. And assuming you meet those minimum requirements, you're fine in that regard. Okay. And I think the person at, in your case, at Villanova University was really instrumental in helping you make that fit. Um, in terms of, you know, what you needed to know and how to apply. But then um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the university where you had your office and you were doing your research? And then we'll have to um, look at the photos that you mm -hmm. provided that we, can, that we can show. Yeah, so I was based at Odessa Mechnikov National University at the Odessa Center for Nonproliferation. So when you're applying, you select your host institution and you get in touch with people at your host institution in advance. They basically have to agree to host you and provide a, a letter confirming this and that they want you to come and, and you submit that as part of your application. So I got in contact with um, two of the people who were very, very helpful to me during my Fulbright program, Volodymyr Dvovic and uh, Polina Sinovets, who were great friends to me, wonderful, wonderful supportive people. I got in touch with them prior to going to Ukraine. So by the time that I actually went, they had a place for me. There was a desk available. They really welcomed me into the university and gave me the opportunity to help assist them with projects. And they would in turn help me with my research. So I, I'm so grateful to everyone at that university. And um, I should mention, I was also affiliated with another university. I almost forgot to mention this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Professor Serhei Kvit also um, was one of my affiliates. So he is actually a former minister of education of the country of Ukraine. So it was very, um, I was very honored to have the opportunity to work with him and also be connected to um, Kiev Mohila Academy um, in Kiev, which is one of the, both, both of these universities are very prominent in Ukraine. So both of those institutions were, and the people there were very welcoming and I'm so grateful to all of them. Now you've introduced a couple of cities, Odessa that's more in the South and on the Black Sea and then Kyiv, which is in the north, and it's uh, the capital. So I wonder like now if it would be a good time to talk about the, uh, the photographs and tell us a, a little bit about your experience in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, so starting with the, the first uh, photograph, it's an evening photo and you're in the city of Kyiv. If you could uh, talk about that and where you are in that, in that photo. So in that particular photo, I am in front of a square in Kyiv called Maidan Nezalezhnosti, which means independent square. And it's a very important place in the city because that will be, if, if there's protests going on, if people are demonstrating, it will be at Maidan. <laughs> and there have been some very famous protests that took place there, particularly in 2014, um, because the people living in Ukraine in, involved in this protest wanted the government to be m working with the EU more and with Russia less. So this is very famous, um, a very famous uh, series of, of protests. 
that took place at this particular monument. And so. uh, just so briefly, uh, Ukraine is located geographically between, I'll just say the EU, right, and Russia. And so it's so important uh, politically and strategically, if you could say something about that really briefly. <laughs> really briefly. So <laughs> yes, Ukraine is, uh, there's a very famous book by Professor uh, Sergei Plochy on the history of Ukraine that he calls Gates of Europe, because it really is the center between what we think of as the East and the West. It, it Ukraine is that central point where both of these cultures, these ideas that we have of how the world is oriented, they meet in Ukraine. And both Russia and Western Europe and the rest of, you know, Central Europe, just Europe in general, both have interests in Ukraine. And Ukraine has a history of being involved uh, with, with one empire trying to seize the territory and then another empire trying to seize the territory. And um, in my experience, what Ukrainians want is just to be an independent country. And that is just, that's, they're independent now. They have finally achieved their independence. And it's just about now asserting the role that they want to have in the world, which is, it's a process. It's a young country um, in terms of being an independent country. And it's politically in development, they're they're asserting their place in the world. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's that's really good. And then the, the second photograph that you provided, and we just have photographs of you because we're protecting other people's privacy. But there were all kind of other photographs that we could have shared, um, but we but we did not for those uh, privacy reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but the second photo, you are in a large body of water. So can you describe that mm -hmm. one? Yes, that is in the Black Sea. So that is when I was, th this particular photo is um, in the southernmost point um, of Odessa, which is the Black Sea. Um, and um, yeah, the city is on the coast. It's a port city. And this is where I spent the majority of my time during my Fulbright. I was living in Odessa. And near the Potemkin Steps, Mm -hmm. I guess we have had a photo of that if if we had all world enough in time yeah. um, nearby. And then the Ukrainian Navy, not very far from there at all. Yeah, they're uh, also based in Odessa. But also such a nice, a nice beach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, a nice city for, and I guess uh, a lot of people vacation in Odessa and yes. the surrounding coast along the um, along the Black Sea there which is, I just never knew about that. You know, I just never knew about that before. And then the, um, the third picture, you are indoors and there's a beautiful chandelier suspended from the ceiling and there's some Greek statuary sort of even reaching into the image. So where are you in, in that photograph? So that photo was also in Odessa and that's at their very famous opera house. And it is just absolutely gorgeous. I cannot even express that enough. That they also have a very famous ballet company, and I attended numerous ballets uh, and operas when I was living in Odessa. I guess one thing that people don't realize either, um, talking about Ukraine and where it's um, geographically located, is the cultural influences of other European countries in yes. in the city in Odessa itself. Yes, Odessa is definitely the, many cultures have had an influence on it. It was once part of the Russian Empire. It um, was for a sizable amount of the time, a Jewish settlement. So up until World War II, about half of the population of the city was Jewish. And then some of the other founders of the city who really helped develop it, um, were Italian and French, and that is why there's a significant amount of um, European-style architecture in Odessa as well. Okay, so um, we're starting to wind down. <laughs> One quick question I have, though, is um, the studies that you took, are they in Russian, are they in English, or is it a combination of the two? 
So in Ukraine, I frequently spoke English with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, most of the research I was doing, I, I wrote my paper in English. Mm -hmm. um, that was never, um, I did do research in Russian, but um, for the most part, I, I spoke with my colleagues in English. Um, okay. But other than that, I was interacting with people in Russian and I was doing my best to interact mm -hmm. with people in Ukrainian in other cities. I took uh, a number of Ukrainian lessons uh, when I was in Ukraine as well. Okay. That was another so, city also. Lviv was another city that you went to. Yes, I spent about a month living in Lviv um, doing a Ukrainian language program, which that is in the West and it is a very Ukrainian speaking city. Okay. While Odessa is Russian speaking. Okay. So if you had to um, promote the program, what are the key points you would like everybody to know? About Fulbright, it is mm -hmm. a wonderful opportunity to experience another culture and to share your own. It allows you to be a civilian diplomat mm -hmm. and to really have an honest, it's a very honest experience of sharing your own culture and being open and learning about another culture. It's a, a wonderful exchange that happens. And I think that is the most important thing about the Fulbright program is the opportunity for you to learn from the people who are living in another country and also what then they can learn from you. It's very rewarding. Great. We certainly thank you, Lucy, for um, this interview today and being able to speak about your experiences and provide information in regard to the Fulbright um, Scholars Program that I'm sure people learned a lot <laughs> of information. And so um, thank you for, um, for the information that you provided. And just to let our viewing audience know that um, our program of Have Your Say, the um, gist is to be able to present different topics, different people, different exposures. And as you're getting information, receiving information, that you as well will be able to consider and think about what you've heard, and you are going to be able to have your say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh.